As we begin our discussion of joints and the movements they allow, we need to first recognize that not all joints move, which might surprise some of you. A joint is simply what we call in anatomy an articulation. That's any place in the body where bone meets bone. So there are many, many joints that link the approximately 206 bones in the body. We'll see that at joints, the articulating bones are linked to each other by ligaments, cartilage, and other tissues that are scientifically classified as connective tissues, which seems like a pretty good name for them. And since movable joints are central to motion, we have a lot to cover here, so let's get started. Any joint in the body can be classified in two ways. One way is based on the joint's function, specifically how much it moves. The second approach classifies joints by their structure in terms of their connective tissue linkages. Functionally, joints are classified as synarthrotic, amphiarthrotic, or diarthrotic joints by their degree of movement, since arth is the medical term for joint. Synarthrotic joints do not move at all. Amphiarthrotic joints provide a bit of limited movement while diarthrotic joints are the typical articulations we think of because they provide free movement in at least two directions. In this functional scheme, the prefix syn means united or with, like in the words synthesis or synchronous. Joints like a growth plate in a child's bone, a tooth in a dental socket, or the cranial sutures, which are the joints between bones of the skull, those would all be examples of synarthrotic joints. None of those places where bone articulates with bone or tooth root articulates with bone, none are joints that allow movement, so they won't be a main focus of this course. Amphi means both or around, like in amphibians, most of which can live on land and in water, or the word amphitheater, meaning theater in the round. With regard to joints of the body, amphiarthrotic joints are bone-to-bone -bone linkages that allow a fairly limited degree of motion. Examples would include joints between two adjacent vertebrae where the intervertebral discs link two bones of the spine, or the pubic symphysis that unites the two pelvic bones anteriorly. Since those types of joints do allow some movement, we will discuss some of those in this course. Articulations with free movement, the diarthrotic joints of the body, will be covered throughout this course. Di is a prefix that means two because diarthrotic joints are freely movable in at least two directions. This functional classification includes all the stereotypical joints people think of, like the shoulder, hip, elbow, knee, and joints within the fingers or toes. These are the most complex joints in the body as well, and so they're also the most prone to injury and painful dysfunction. The diarthrotic joints are a primary focus of health professions and other fields, including orthopedic medicine, physical and occupational therapy, fitness coaching, and athletic training. I said earlier that you could take any joint in the body and classify it two ways. First, by its degree of movement, as we just learned, and secondly, by its connective tissue linkages or structure. We've defined synarthrotic, amphiarthrotic, and diarthrotic as the three functional classifications. Now let's take a few minutes to talk about the three structural classifications to which joints can also be assigned. Joints that have little or no movement, those are the amphiarthrotic joints and synarthrotic joints, those are both structurally classified as either fibrous joints or cartilaginous joints, based on the type of connective tissue that links the facing surfaces of the two bones that form the joint. By facing surfaces, I mean their adjacent articulating ends. In fibrous joints, the two bones are united edge to edge by some type of dense fibrous connective tissue. These tissue types are loaded with collagen fibers, which is why they're said to be dense. To go back to some earlier examples, a tooth is held in a dental socket by fibrous connective tissue that forms the periodontal ligament. The sutures between bones of the skull are knitted together by what's known as dense irregular fibrous connective tissue. 
This is because the bundles of collagen travel in multiple or irregular orientations to help resist force or movement in many directions. In both of these examples, a tooth in its socket or the sutures of the skull, the joints are structurally fibrous because dense connective tissues join the adjacent bones and they're functionally classified as synarthrotic since both are articulations that do not move. The second structural classification is that of cartilaginous joints. In these, the two bones are united together end to end by some type of cartilage, which is a firm, white, flexible tissue. The growth plate in a child's bone is an example of a cartilaginous joint, one in which the shaft, remember that's called the diaphysis, is united to the bony ends, the epiphyses, by plates of cartilage specifically a variety of cartilage known as hyaline cartilage. Now, growth plate is definitely a joint between bones or really within a bone that should not move. In fact, if the growth plate is disrupted by injury, the result can be devastating to the growth of that bone. Unless it's medically treated, damage to the growth plate can cause premature union of the shaft and the adjacent end and that can permanently stunt the growth of that bone. Before various types of surgical and therapeutic interventions, when a kid had damage to a growth plate in the femur of the thigh, they would often wind up with one leg shorter than the other. On the other hand, or should I say the other foot, a fracture of the mid shaft of a bone like the femur will lay down a callus of new bone during the healing process. And this can actually slightly lengthen the bone that was broken. It's strange that depending on when and where the fracture occurs, the damaged bone could end up either shorter or longer than the one that wasn't injured. Something else of interest when considering a growth plate as a joint is that a growth plate is a temporary joint within a long bone. Since when the growth is complete in that bone, the growth plate closes up. Sutures of the skull can also seal up with age, making them temporary joints in many people as well. And remember, the number of bones varies with age, and 206 is simply an average number in an adult. So if sutures fuse, the person technically no longer has 206 bones. Anyway, these fusions don't hinder any movement since neither growth plates or cranial sutures are movable joints in the first place. Here's some more information on cartilaginous joints. With regard to the intervertebral discs of the spine or the pubic symphysis of the pelvis, the connective tissue between the faces of the adjacent bones is a pad of fibrocartilage, which contains more collagen fibers, so is stronger than hyaline cartilage. But the intervertebral discs and the pubic symphysis still allow for a slight degree of movement. So they're functionally amphiarthrotic joints and structurally cartilaginous joints, since fibrocartilage is a type of cartilage. There's a little bit of movement between the bodies of any two adjacent vertebrae, which aids the flexibility of the spine, and a little bit of movement at the pubic symphysis, such as when we walk. To summarize all this, when comparing the structural and functional classifications, Synarthrotic articulations are immovable joints. These are either fibrous or cartilaginous in their structural classification. The same is true of our slightly movable joints, the body's amphiarthrotic articulations. They are also either fibrous or cartilaginous structurally. But when it comes to our freely movable articulations, they are all structurally classified as synovial joints. You could say that all diarthrotic joints are synovial joints and all synovial joints are diarthrotic. Now, I may have lost you in all that classification, but if you're like me, you enjoy the terminology and the way it helps to sort and organize concepts. Keep in mind that the main focus of joints in this course will be on our freely movable synovial joints. You've probably heard the term synovial before. 
it refers to the types of fluid producing membranes that line all of our freely movable joints. But that membrane is not what makes synovial joints freely movable. First and foremost, these are movable diarthrotic joints because of the presence of a joint cavity inside of what's called a joint capsule. The joint cavity is a space between the two articulating bones lined by the synovial membrane. And the capsule is a collective structure that links the bones and surrounds the joint cavity. Let's look deeper into the details of synovial joints since they're the most common articulations in the body and the most commonly injured. At the knee, for example, the femur of the thigh meets the tibia of the shin, but the bones are not joined together at their facing articular surfaces the way they are in fibrous or cartilaginous joints. Instead, the bones are held together at other regions, slightly proximal and slightly distal to the actual joint, by what's called the joint's capsule. Now this capsule unites the bones but leaves their facing surfaces, covered by what's called articular cartilage, free to move against each other. The joint capsule contains the joint cavity, and that space is lined by a synovial membrane. Now the synovial membrane is composed of a very thin layer of cells that secrete a mucus-like lubricating fluid that has the consistency of, well, truthfully, the consistency of snot. You know, nasal mucus? Hey, remember, this is gross anatomy. When a joint is opened, that synovial fluid will string between your fingers. So it's clear, but it's viscous. Not as thick as syrup, it's more like egg white, and it actually contains some of the same compounds like the protein albumin. This synovial fluid has two roles. First, it nourishes the structures within the joint and also removes waste products from the joint's tissues. While bones have their own rich blood supply, cartilage is said to be avascular, which means it lacks its own internal blood supply. So the synovial fluid is especially important to the nourishment of cartilage and the motions that occur at these freely movable joints, they're actually good for the cartilage. This is because the movements squish the cartilage while they circulate the synovial fluid around, promoting the release of wastes from the cartilage and the uptake of nutrients into it. One of the reasons that cartilage is so slow to heal is that it lacks its own intrinsic blood supply that would normally bring nutrients easily into the tissue. I often tell my future physical therapy students that the avascular nature of cartilage alone may put one of their kids through college. Bone, on the other hand, heals quite well. In fact, if you broke a bone, especially as a child, and it healed properly, the prior fracture will no longer be visible in the bone, not even on x-ray. In addition to nourishing joint tissue, synovial fluid also creates this viscous film of lubricant within the joint cavity. And that aids the free movement that's possible at diarthrotic joints. Now, these synovial membranes are only found within and around the capsules of synovial joints, thus the naming. Now, what about the capsule? The capsule is an envelope-like structure that in some cases is a connective tissue sleeve that spans the two articulating bones at a distance from the actual bony joint. The capsule is thickened in regions by ligaments and may have tendons incorporated into it as well. In musculoskeletal anatomy, Ligaments are usually strap-like or cord-like structures that connect bone to bone, while tendons connect muscle to bone. Both ligaments and tendons contain parallel bundles of collagen fibers for strength and to resist stress in one main direction. By the way, while ligaments and tendons contain a far lesser blood supply than bone, they do have more vessels than in cartilage. 
So they have kind of a mid-range ability to heal when damaged. Anyway, the capsule provides some stability by joining the two bones, while the joint cavity and its synovial membrane lining facilitate movement between the articulating bones. The ligaments, as we will see, reinforce aspects of the diarthrotic joint that need more support, such as on the medial and lateral sides of what we call a hinge joint. These ligaments restrict movement on the sides where they cross the joint space, helping to ensure that movement occurs only in the intended directions. The joint's ligaments can be thickenings in the capsule itself, termed intrinsic ligaments, or they can be outside the capsule, so-called extracapsular ligaments. And in some instances, they're even inside the capsule, like the intracapsular ligaments of the knee known as the cruciate ligaments. The capsule is incomplete in places, such as where it allows small blood vessels into the joint, or allows a bit of synovial membrane to protrude out as something called a bursa. A bursa is a small pocket of synovial membrane outside the joint capsule. And it can be between bone and tendon, between skin and bone, between bone and ligament, really between almost any two structures around a joint. The bursa serves to cushion structures around the joint and to allow those adjacent structures, like the skin or a ligament, to pass more easily across underlying structures when the joint moves. So while the synovial membrane lines the interior of the joint cavity, the joint's bursae are small pockets of synovial membrane that surround the joint and may even physically communicate with the joint's synovial lining, like an outpouching of the synovial membrane. Any bursa that is structurally continuous with the joint's synovial lining can be precarious if a superficial injury introduces infection into a bursa just below the skin, sometimes called a subcutaneous bursa. The infection can spread from the bursa into the synovial lining of the joint. But those connecting bursae can also serve as pressure relievers if an injury causes inflammation of the joint cavity's synovial lining, since the fluids can escape from the joint cavity into a nearby connected bursa. A bursitis is the medical term for an inflamed bursa, as you might already know. Now, when you see an elbow all blown out with bursitis, though it looks very dramatic and I'm sure is quite painful, there may really be nothing wrong with the bones or ligaments of the joint itself. A bursa can be inflamed from infection, injury, or just excess pressure which can happen in occupations where people have to repeatedly lean on elbows or knees, like carpet layers or plumbers who may have to get into tight spaces. Like other membranes of the body that get infected or injured, the synovial membrane's reaction to inflammation is to oversecrete. This is similar to the way in which mucous membranes that line the nasal cavity can produce excess fluids when they get infected or are inflamed from allergies. In some cases, when a bursa is inflamed, a clinician may need to drain the joint to relieve the pressure. Bursitis can be reoccurring or just a one-time thing, but it's most common in the elbow, shoulder, and hip joints. Now, not all movable joints have bursae around them, but all have synovial capsules lined by synovial membranes, and any of those membranes can become inflamed. Other features that may or may not be present at diarthrotic joints include articular discs, such as the menisci of the knee, or the disc within the wrist joint at the distal ulna, and when present at a synovial joint, the disc serves like a shock-absorbing pad of fibrocartilage that helps cushion the joint. It can also aid in keeping the articulating bones in position by improving their fit, which helps prevent dislocation. We'll see that later when we study individual joints of the body. 
Keep in mind that while these pads may be composed of fibrocartilage, these are still diarthrotic synovial joints, not cartilaginous joints. The articular discs are within the capsule of the joint, surrounded by the synovial membrane. And as we work our way through the course, we'll cover the specifics of different joints. Right now, we're just looking at the general features of diarthrotic synovial joints. Another thing to consider is that the capsule also contains sensory nerve endings. And not just for pain, but also for what are called the senses of proprioception or kinesthesia, which relay the locations and movements of our body parts by monitoring joint position and tension on the capsule structures. Our nervous system uses these signals to help us balance as we move. But they're also the reason we know where our body parts are in space without even looking. Monitors known as joint kinesthetic receptors, Golgi tendon organs, and muscle cells known as spindle fibers, these all relay proprioceptive sensations that aid our musculoskeletal performance. Of course, brain regions and the inner ear are also involved in balance. But some of the incoming information comes from sensory receptors in the joints and their surrounding muscles. As we will see time and again in this course, structure and function are highly interrelated. You may have heard the adage, form follows function. In anatomy, it's often said in reverse, that structure determines function. Now that we've talked about joint structure, let's transition to a few more specifics on joint movement. I'm sure you've heard the phrase range of motion with regard to joints. The directions and degrees of movement at a joint are determined by many factors. One is the specific shapes of the two articulating bones where they meet each other. We'll look at lots of specific examples of that in the course but a clear example is seen at the elbow. The hinge nature of the elbow is obvious just from looking at the structure of the articulating bones. The hook shape of the proximal ulna, which is the more medial of the two bones in the forearm, moves around the spool-shaped end of the distal humerus, allowing bending, or flexion as we call it, and straightening, known as extension. The large bony pointed landmark called the olecranon process at the proximal ulna prevents excessive movement in the opposite direction of flexion, which would be called hyperextension. The normal shapes of the proximal ulna and distal humerus simply don't allow for much in the way of backward movement beyond straightening the elbow in extension. Another factor that can limit range of motion at a joint is simply the size of the muscles or the amount of body fat in the area. For example, if a bodybuilder has a huge biceps muscle, he or she might not be able to fully flex at the elbow. Likewise, people who are obese may not get the typical range of motion at some of their joints because excess soft tissues are in the way of the movement. People who can move in ways that most of us cannot, like contortionists, ballet dancers, or yogis, have trained their ligaments and their joint capsules to be increasingly more loose or lax by repeatedly stretching those structures over time in a given direction. There's really no such thing as being double jointed. People don't have multiple joints where others have just one. Instead, these highly flexible people have naturally pliable ligaments or have relaxed their ligaments by repeated stretching while practicing various movements. They could also have an underlying connective tissue disorder that makes their ligaments loose. On the other hand, joints that don't get moved and stretched can become increasingly less mobile, like the syndrome known as frozen shoulder, which is medically called adhesive capsulitis. That's because it causes the capsule to thicken and tighten around the shoulder joint. Frozen shoulder can occur when the arm is immobilized for a while, like following surgery or after a stroke, 
or due to painful conditions like rotator cuff tear. It's often a vicious cycle because the more the shoulder hurts, the less the person tends to use it, and the less they use it, the tighter the shoulder gets. Within reason, joint movement is a use it or lose it proposition. The good news is that most people can recover with treatment, such as using anti-inflammatory medications, steroid injections into the joint, and physical therapy, but it can take months or even years to resolve. Still, other joint pathologies like carpal tunnel of the wrist or pitcher's elbow can result from overuse. Joint movement is a tricky thing, like a Goldilocks situation. We don't want to use them too much nor too little. There has to be a happy medium where things are just right. Arthritis can also be an overuse syndrome, but that's only true of regional arthritis, called osteoarthritis. That's what most would call the wear and tear form of arthritis. Now, when I say regional, that means the problem is confined to the area that's been overused, like arthritis that develops in the hands of some, someone who has spent a lifetime knitting, cleaning teeth as a dental professional, or playing a musical instrument. Osteoarthritis can occur in the back and shoulders of a pipe fitter, weightlifter, or a construction worker. It can also happen in the knees and hips of a nurse or an athlete, whether a pro athlete or a weekend warrior. So regional arthritis can come from repeated use of a body region over a career. That's the wear in the wear and tear of osteoarthritis. But what about the tear? Osteoarthritis can also follow an injury to a joint, especially if the damage changes the way in which the joint normally moved before it was injured. Let's say an athlete damages her knee in high school playing volleyball. She could end up getting arthritis in that particular knee as she gets older. And it isn't limited to just tearing a ligament. Arthritis can follow any injury to a joint. The damage can continue to progress and get so extensive as to erode away the articular disc if that particular joint has one and even wear off the articular cartilage on the ends of the bones involved in the joint. This results in bone rubbing on bone to the point of what is called eburnation, which results in a polishing effect on the adjacent surfaces. This bone can end up resembling ivory that's been polished like a gemstone. I've seen this on coroner's cases at the morgue and in cadavers in the gross anatomy lab, especially in the knees. I've also heard from clinicians and my former physical therapy students that you can sometimes even hear the grinding of bone against bone in these patients when they move a particular joint. There are also countless examples of osteoarthritis in historic and prehistoric skeletal samples, which I learned about while in graduate school, researching the specialty known as paleopathology, the study of diseases in ancient times. Undoubtedly, the average person back then had a much more physical life than many of us do today. And just like in modern times, some use their joints in specific ways related to their occupation or their culture. Phrases like kayak hip, archer's elbow, and mono and matate toe from kneeling while grinding meal, these were used to describe wear and tear patterns of arthritis in particular cultural groups related to their life ways. Just like today you hear of syndromes like tennis elbow, which in my case my doctor called gravedigger's elbow, but that's a story I'll mention in another lesson. Now in anatomy and physiology, while regional means localized, the opposite of regional is systemic meaning something such as a condition that involves multiple organs or tissues within one or more body systems. Some types of arthritis are systemic varieties. This means they cause pain and disability throughout numerous joints of the musculoskeletal system. But these conditions can also affect other body tissues, especially other connective tissues. At the root of systemic arthritis is the person's immune system. These autoimmune disorders, as they're called, include types such as rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, 
lupus, ankylosing spondylitis, and juvenile arthritis that affects children. In these conditions, the patient's immune system turns its ability to attack foreign cells and tissues on the person's own native cells and tissues. This misguided uptick of the immune system causes widespread inflammation, and the joints affected can vary depending on type. For example, rheumatoid arthritis particularly affects the synovial membrane lining of small joints in the hands and feet, while ankylosing spondylitis affects the spine, pelvis, and rib cage, causing the connective tissues in these areas to ossify and turn into bone. Evidence for these types of arthritis goes back to historic and even prehistoric times. Several of the pharaohs of Egypt had ankylosing spondylitis, which causes what has been termed bamboo spine because the entire spine fuses to the ribs and the pelvis. Paleopathological studies also indicate evidence for rheumatoid arthritis in both new and old world populations. Not only do these conditions damage joints and affect movement, but depending on the type of systemic arthritis, they can cause anemia, fever, fatigue, gastrointestinal issues, skin problems, and complications of the eyes, kidneys, and lungs. Under a doctor's care, these patients will need careful monitoring of their inflammatory process to delay or slow progressive joint damage. They will also receive recommendations on how to best ensure pain-free movement as much as possible while still keeping the joints as active as is feasible. When it comes to joint mobility, we somewhat face a use it or lose it proposition. Low impact activities that encourage a range of motion, such as swimming, biking, walking, yoga, and Tai Chi, can typically help those with systemic arthritis keep their joints moving. With this said, keep in mind that I am a PhD, not an MD. And these are general guidelines that can be found in many different sources online and in the literature. People should always check with a physician for their good health. As I often say to my students, don't come to me for medical advice. All my patients are already deceased. They're that way when I meet them. Okay, in the next lesson, we'll continue our study of joints, looking at specific types of diarthrotic joints and how the shapes of the articulating bones dictate the types of movements possible at that joint.